patiently upon the Lord And he inclined and heard my cry He pulled me up out of the mind we clay He set my feet up on a rock He gave me beauty for ashes And joy for my morning And praise for heaviness song in my mouth and a crown upon my head he gave me life forevermore he's been so good so so good to me so good so so good to me so good so so good to me jesus so good so so good to me so good, so so, yes, he has. So good, so so good to me, Jesus. Cause he picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I remember when he picked me up, he turned me around, and he placed my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I remember when he picked me up, turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground, hallelujah, hallelujah. I remember when he picked me up, he turned me around, and he placed my feet on solid ground, hallelujah, hallelujah. He's been so good, so, so good to me, so good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. He's been so good, so, so good to me. So good, he's been so good, so, so good to me, Jesus. I've got to love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Oh, 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 yeah. I've got to love, joy, peace, righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I've got to love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I've got to love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. to me so good so so yes he has so good so so good to me jesus he's been so good so so good to me so good so so he's been so good so so good to me jesus he's been so good so so good to me so good so so yes he is so good so so good to me jesus he's been so good so so good to me so good so so yes he has so good so so good to me jesus oh thank you jesus Hello everyone, my name is Reverend Terry Swan. I'm the lead pastor here at Salem. One church in three locations, South City, Mid County, and right here online. We're so glad that you've joined us. We'd love for you to take time to register your attendance today. You can do that by going to the comment section here on Facebook or go to the Salem app. There's a lot going on in the life of our church, including classes that are beginning. The first one is why we sing. If you've ever wondered about that, we invite you to join this to learn more about hymns and other music and worship. Plan to attend this class called Why We Sing. This discussion group will meet on Monday evenings from June 14th through July 12th at 7 p.m. at our Mid-County site in the choir room and it's led by Stephen Morton. The second one is our Impact Student Ministries event. This is for grades 6 through 12. They're going to be rock climbing, there's going to be a live DJ, and of course pizza. So we invite you to join us at Salem UMC Front Lawn, June 26, 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. And you can register online at SalemSTLewis.com. And now I'd love for you to pray with me as we begin worship. Holy and loving God, may we be met by you in this experience wherever we are in this community. 
wash down upon us your spirit. We ask that you continue to show us your way, direct our paths, and to help us to know you more. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil a while we remain. Come set our hearts someplace with home, like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize. To see the captive hearts release the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth.
Hello, church. I'm Deborah Lemoyne, the executive pastor at Salem, and I am happy to be here wrapping up our sermon series on the book of Ecclesiastes. That's a phrase we tend to say lightly, happy to be here, but I use it intentionally today. I am truly, deeply happy to be here. It's Race for the Cure Week in St. Louis, a week when we celebrate breast cancer survivors, remember the moms and sisters and friends and wives and daughters we've lost to the disease, and we raise money for the research that's going to lead us on toward a cure. I've participated before. It is a great cause. But this is the first time I've ever picked up a pink t-shirt with the word survivor written on it. Survivor. That is a heavy word. It is a humbling word. In the time since I was diagnosed with a very treatable form of breast cancer at Thanksgiving, we've lost two amazing Salem women to less treatable varieties of the disease. I'll sing the praises of early detection and mammograms for the rest of my life, but fundamentally, I can't tell you why I get to be the one standing here today, and they don't. They had amazing faith that will continue to inspire us. I can tell you that when I spent six weeks in bed recovering from surgery, and I can't thank you enough for the prayers and cards and food that my family received in those weeks, I thought a lot about the meaning of life, the meaning of my life in particular, I feel like the medical advances of the last 10 years gave me a bonus season of life. And I think that's why I've been so drawn to the book of Ecclesiastes this year. Solomon wrote the book late in his own life as he reflected on what it all meant. Not everyone had my experience this year, but we've all had something, something that made us think. The pandemic and its fallout have made us all look at life differently. It's fragile and it's unpredictable, but we don't want to let go of it, do we? We've realized that life is hevel, that hard to translate word we've been talking about for the past four weeks. Life really is hevel, uncontrollable, fleeting, like your breath on a cold winter day or the scent of barbecue ribs smoking on a hot day. We can't capture it, but we can savor it. We can't control our lives, but we can do something meaningful with them. Because pink shirt or not, none of us is going to live forever. Life is finite. And what we do with the days we've been given is up to us. So what do we do? It's the great question of life, isn't it? One of my favorite passages from the book of Ecclesiastes has an answer. Go, Solomon said, eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a happy heart for God has already approved of what you do. It is a feel-good bit of scripture, perfect for a post-pandemic summer patio party. But the old King James translator said it a little bit differently. Go thy way, the old King James said. Eat thy bread with joy and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. That's a little less playful, isn't it? One version seems to say God approves of our eating and drinking, but the other says he accepts our work. The amplified version of the Bible is a real killjoy though, because it adds a qualifying verse. Go your way, it says. Eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a cheerful heart if, if you are righteous, wise, and in the hands of God. For God has already approved and accepted your works. As is so often the case when we're translating Hebrew into English, the translation makes a big difference. What is this word work that Solomon is talking about that's so hard to translate? The word for what you do or your works that muddles up this phrase is used a lot in the Old Testament, and it has nothing to do with eating and drinking. It's a Hebrew word that's even harder to pronounce than it is to translate. So I won't even try. We'll put it up on the screen for you to see. But it is the word that Joseph uses in the book of Genesis when he's prepping his brothers to go before Pharaoh to explain themselves. He tells his brothers, Pharaoh will ask, what is your occupation? And he told his brothers to answer, we are shepherds since our birth. Their occupation, literally what occupied their time, was their identity. It was how they explained to Pharaoh and to the world who they were, shepherds. I think many of us still tend to define ourselves by our work in this way today. Over and over again, in the books of the Old Testament, the word is translated as the work of the hands of a skilled artisan, 
a weaver of garments, an engraver of stone, a sculptor of gold. But people aren't the only ones working. When God wrote the Ten Commandments in stone, this is the word the Bible uses for the work that he did, the actual writing. When God led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, this is the word for the work God did when parting the Red Sea. The word refers to big works and to small ones, and not necessarily to the thing that earns a paycheck. Weaving, shepherding, rescuing a people, it's all work. Throughout the Old Testament, this is the word for doing something, making something, taking some kind of creative action, for good or for bad, really. Sometimes God is pleased with the work people have done, and sometimes the prophets show us God is deeply displeased. But there can be no doubt that the work matters. What we do with our lives makes a difference, just as what God does matters. And the Bible tells us that the work we do and the work that God does are deeply connected to one another. In a beautiful passage from the eighth Psalm, the word is used twice when the psalmist says these famous words, O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers have made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? You've made them only slightly less than divine, crowding them with glory and with grandeur. You've let them rule over your handiwork the very work of God's hands. According to the psalmist, God's work was creating the world. And then he places that beautiful work of his hands, what his fingers actually made into our very human hands. God's work becomes our work. It is entrusted to us. And as much as I love good bread and good wine, I think what Solomon has realized by the time he writes Ecclesiastes is that it is not good bread and good wine that make our hearts happy. It is the doing of good work. We can only enjoy our bread and our wine, the so-called good things in life, and Solomon had plenty of them. When we know that what we're doing with our lives really matters. There is a season for working, Ecclesiastes tells us. All sorts of work. A time to build, a time to gather, a time to mend, a time to speak a time for dreaming and a time for getting things done. It is in the daily work of life that we change reality. We're called to do the work we love and that makes the world more whole because our work and God's work are really one and the same. I've started a new book group to help us dive deeper into the sermon series each month. And the book for this series is Joan Chittister's book called A Season for Everything. She wrote a chapter called A Time to Build Up that tackles this issue of work really well. She looks at the story of Noah building the ark from an interesting angle. She doesn't talk about the part with the animals two by two or even the rainbow in the sky, but about what happens when the storm is over. She says no storm lasts forever. Sooner or later, every wind passes. Then the time comes to start over to do things better than before, to produce an alternative product, a finer idea, a truer system, a preferable institution, a gentler nation than the one that preceded this one. It is a time of new creation. Do you feel like you've been through a storm this past year? Like you were forced to build an ark of sorts and close the doors to the rest of the world and wait out a storm that went on far longer than expected. And does the world seem just a little bit different now? It is indeed a time of new creation. That means it's an exciting time. But I must admit that in times of change, I tend to worry. And when I worry, my family and our staff will all confirm this, I tend to cling. I want to gather all my people around me and keep them safe somehow. I want the church to have a lot of money in the operating reserve. I want security and stability and control over what happens next and a timeline for when it's going to happen. And that's not all bad. 
It makes me a good planner, a stable manager in a time of crisis. But sometimes, in my attempt to control the future, I forget that it's not all up to me. So the last four weeks of studying Ecclesiastes have been really good for me. Because life isn't meaningless, friends, but it isn't controllable either. Everything is hevel, Solomon told us. Trying to cling to it is as futile as chasing the wind. Despite all his beautiful words, Solomon himself struggled to find the answer to the meaning of life. But we have an advantage over Solomon because we have access to the next chapter of the story God is writing. Jesus actually refers back to Solomon's struggles in his own teaching, and Matthew and Luke both quote him in their Gospels. Jesus was talking to the warriors of his own day, which was also a time of great social change, and his message is just as clear for us today. Therefore, I tell you, Jesus said, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Consider how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was adorned like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry. Do not say, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles strive after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus tells us. That's where the meaning lies. We are in a season of rebuilding reopening, coming back together. We have an opportunity not just to go back to normal, but to build something new, that new creation Chittister refers to, something that looks more like the kingdom of God. And we have an example that Solomon didn't have. The earliest Christians saw Jesus not just as a teacher of wisdom, but as wisdom embodied the word of God made flesh and dwelling among us. And what did embodied wisdom actually do with the life he was given? What was the work of his hands? Jesus fed the hungry. He healed the sick, set free the oppressed. He brought sight to the blind, ate with the outcast, called the children to him. He preached good news with his words and with his actions. He did the miraculous and he used ordinary people like you and me to get it done. The wisdom literature of the Old Testament is part of a larger story that is made more clear in Jesus' life and is still ongoing through our work together today. I've been thinking a lot about what this sort of work looks like for us as a church. This summer, Salem will host a group of 20 children, first and second graders, for Freedom School at our South City site and will provide the financial support for 50 more kids on campus at LifeWise. If you're not yet familiar with the Freedom School program, it is a six week summer camp school program designed to help low income elementary school scholars avoid summer learning loss, increase their literacy, their reading levels, and believe in their ability to make a difference in themselves and their families and their communities. It is a program centered on the understanding that when Jesus asked the little children to come to him, he meant all of them. Not just the kids from our church or our school or our neighborhood, all of them. We first hosted the Freedom School Summer Program the year before the pandemic began. And the day our staff spent reading to the kids on site was probably the happiest staff meeting day we've ever had. 
the joy in our hearts from doing good work with the kids stuck with us. Knowing that what we were doing for the kids as a church made all the difference in their lives, made all of our tasks here seem more worthwhile, and it shaped our vision. When we've made improvements to that building or hired new staff, we've thought about how those decisions would impact the Freedom School kids as much as how they would impact our own kids here. The work changed us as much as it changed the kids involved. Marion Wright Edelman, the founder of the Children's Defense Fund, which started the Freedom School program, has talked about her view of the meaning of life and how it shaped her work. She said, I was taught that the world had a lot of problems, but that I could struggle and change them. That intellectual and material gifts brought the privilege and responsibility of sharing with others less fortunate. And that service, our service is the rent that each of us pays for living, the very purpose of life, and not something you do in your spare time or after you've reached your personal goals. I think the work of the Freedom School program is the sort of creative work Solomon was trying to describe the sort of work that brings meaning to our lives together. We aren't called to transform the world all alone. We work with God and with each other, but we are called to be a part of the work. When we see a problem, we don't just wait for God to do something. We set about doing something ourselves with God. What we do may seem small, but that's okay because we're working side by side with God. So each small thing combines with everyone else's small thing and draws the world one step closer to the vision and the will of God for his people. The great agencies we work with, LifeWise, Epworth, Children's Defense Fund, they were all created by ordinary people who looked at the problems of their communities and found a way to make things better, more like the world that God intends for us. We surrender the timing the final outcome to God. And that can give us hope. Working with kids forces us to take the long view, investing in the future, planting seeds that will bloom far outside our range of sight. Not just feeding kids and teaching them to read, but empowering them to use their voices to make the world a better place. We are a part of a creative work that is bigger than our own plans. I think that's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about seeking first the kingdom of God. And I think that's the kind of work, the kind of doing that Solomon says will make our lives meaningful and our hearts happy because we are working alongside God with hope for the future instead of worry about change. This year, I think we are all survivors of a sort. So celebrate a little. Eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a happy heart. If you've given up gluten or alcohol, adjust accordingly. The point is to enjoy every moment. Enjoy the people you love, but know that life is about more than that. Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus says, because what you do with your life matters. Feed someone, teach someone to read. Use the life you have been given to spread good news. This this precious moment in time is our time of new creation. God has entrusted the very work of his hands to us. And in this season of rebuilding, we have a chance together with God to make this world look a little more like God intended. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we go out into your world full of hope knowing that you have given us the vision and the will to make the world a better place, to feed your people, to care for your children, and to spread the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. Empower us to do it in his name. Amen. So I
Thank you again for worshiping with us and I hope that you'll come and join us on site as things open up this week. Terry mentioned several small groups. We would love to see you in person to talk about the Bible and what we're learning. I also hope you might feel inspired to give to support our work with kids in the city, teaching them to read, keeping them fed, spreading good news. St. Louis is a better place because of the work that we do together with God. I hope you'll join us. Go in peace, friends.